today we're actually going to talk about the RepoPub, the re-executable publication. And the learning objectives of this lecture are to be aware of the issue of reproducibility in the larger context of scientific advancement of knowledge, to be aware of some interactions between the spectrum of reproducibility and the spectrum of generalizability of research findings. To be aware of some of the challenges involved in recording and reporting computationally intense research experiments to others, particularly in publications. And finally, to be introduced to a hybrid model of publication, the RepoPub, that takes both traditional and computationally intensive research processes into account and supplements text with digitally linked experimental specifications. Okay, so Rebrandum kicked off the course with a focus on reproducibility. And now we can circle back and revisit reproducibility from a big picture view. Stepping back a few steps, there are several key principles for conducting reproducible research that have been introduced, including planning ahead and experimental design, use of standards when possible, annotate, and version control for everything. And we can consider in each of those cases why, for example, any of those are important. So for example, Planning ahead is important to make sure you collect the data you'll need later to do the statistical comparisons that you actually want to do. Use of standards makes your life easier. It makes investigators' life easier in general. Standards convey a lot of information in and of themselves. The conventions make data sharing easier and less work, and you don't have to tell people how to decode them. Annotation is incredibly valuable. Why? Well, detailed notes actually help keep you from having to worry about remembering everything that you did, but they also help both you and others understand how and what you have done after you've done it, even much later after you've done it, and why you've done them. Version control is important for lots of reasons, but primarily lots of things can change in the course of an experiment. Um, and in fact, it's almost guaranteed that they will, many things will change. So what changes, when it changes, and why are all important. Use of any or all of these principles will increase the reproducibility of your work. Now, in addition, several methodological approaches for addressing these principles have also been introduced. Now, just to read it a little bit, there are actually many steps that one can take to increase, in, improve their reproducibility and imaging or your research in general, actually. They include study design, data collection, data processing, statistical analysis, and publication. And again, doing something, any one of these things or all of them will improve your work. So any or all of these things can become very engaging on their own. And frankly, they can even become obsessive. They take a lot of time and energy, but they're actually very intriguing puzzles too. But for those of you, particularly if you're coming from an applied field and you're actually trying to combine integrating these principles with your primary line of research, it can also become a lot of time and energy and a bit of a distraction. So unless your own experimental work is strictly focused on one or another principle or tool, the energy involved to focus on learning them may distract from the bigger picture. So what is the bigger picture? And how do we step back to actually consider that question? Well, we've just devoted a lot of time to reproducibility concepts and methods. Isn't reproducibility itself the big picture? And besides that, reproducibility is a hot topic, which is showing up everywhere. So does this make it the big picture? For example, it is trendy in science, which is evident now in the number of conference symposia, special journal issues, and new courses that abound. Reproducibility is also trendy in the mainstream press. And for example, for those of you who are late night comic enthusiasts, um, you can see John Oliver's program on scientific reproducibility as relates to media influences, which is actually pretty spot on for a number of reproducibility issues. And reproducibility is pervasive in neuroimaging, which is particularly vulnerable to reproducible findings. And that's for a lot of reasons, but in, among them, there are many small studies, which means they have low power. There's a myriad of complex technical and experimental parameters to every single experiment, every single experiment. And there are many studies on subtle 
complex biological phenomena that are difficult to detect and or measure. Okay, yes, but why make our work reproducible? Well, reproducibility, while important, is not the big picture. Reproducibility is the means to a higher end. So reproducibility is a fundamental building block to the advancement of scientific discovery, enabling generalization across research findings, and propelling evolution of knowledge as driven by confirmation or refutation of prior or future findings. So if reproducibility is a fundamental cornerstone of scientific work, then is a re-executable or reproducible experiment a new concept or a new discussion of an old idea? Is it all about technology or all about the foundations of scientific knowledge and its evolution? Well, the principles of reproducibility have been historically applicable in experimental practice and academic dis dissemination. So they've been around for a long time. And the spectrum of reproducibility and its extension to the concept and nuances of generalizability have likewise been historically applicable to research investigations. So just to keep in mind now, there's actually a spectrum of reproducibility. I know you've seen this before, but um, just consider that there are two divisions within that spectrum. One, which is about re-executability in which you have either your original data analysis and result or the exact same data and the exact same analysis, which should yield the exact same result. So that's one portion of the spectrum. Now, that's strictly re-executable. So this, the next division actually includes various combinations in which one or another of those components, or perhaps all of them, are actually similar rather than exactly the same as the original data. So that is where we come into the generalizability. You can have the exact same data and nominally similar analyses, or nominally similar data and exact same analyses, or you can actually have nominally similar data and nominally similar analyses, and that should yield, yield a similar result. So there's a re-executability component in which you should get the exact same results if you do the exact same thing with the same sources. And there's a range of generalizations that one can make from using similar data and methods. Okay, so this is an important set of interactions. Okay, so stepping back for context now, a reproducible experiment or publication is actually not a new idea. Keeping in mind now the very much intertwined concepts of reproducibility and generalizability, we can consider the implications of both in the context of a classical experiment. Okay, so this is just a simple experimental outline. Class by classical experiment, I just mean something that's either pre-neuroimaging or wet lab work or something else that's not computational, um, in which you have the study design and some subjects and some methods data, analyses, results, discussion, and in a traditional format, a journal article publication. Now, the classical requirements for reproducibility in this sense are actually very, um, very longstanding, actually. And it is the expectation is that one's methods, acquisition, and analyses must be written with necessary and sufficient detail so that someone other than you and in your absence would be able to re-execute the same analyses that you did and get the same exact results if looking at the same exact data. And there are a lot of ways that that might come into play. Dissertation advisors often require this and they may test you on it in some way or another. Yeah, they may put it to the test. Journal article submissions are rejectable on this basis alone. If someone cannot understand what you have done, then they can't justify what you have done. So it, it, it's quite important. And, in this, in this context of reproducibility, the same rule applies. The same data, the same analysis should yield the same result. And, and the exact same data and the exact same analysis in your lab mate's hands or anyone else's should yield the exact same results if everything has been collected and reported clearly. Okay, so now let's consider the second part of the, the spectrum of reproducibility and that's in the generalization area. So in a classical experiment, the generalizations will actually come up in the discussion section in a journal article publication. So this is the portion in which you actually may be looking at the generalization from your findings. And the expectations would be that your primary findings, which 
as I was trained and I, I, I think this will continue to hold is the primary findings are your data. Those primary findings should be reproducible by others in any of the generalized conditions of reproducibility on the spectrum. That means someone has the same data and does a similar analysis, someone has similar data that uses the same analysis you did, or someone has similar data and a similar analysis and should get a similar result. Now, the inferences and the implications of your findings are actually very important for yours or anyone else's in terms of spreading ideas and they may be extraordinarily influential in accomplishing that end. But the generalized reproducibility or not of your primary findings is the building block of scientific advancement. And the expectation really is that the generalizations will change over time. And the hope is that they will change over time as people think about them, do some more experiments, adjust and readjust. If things don't readjust, then we don't progress. So it's just that this portion of the experiment, it's, it's very important to distinguish between where you're making inferences and where you're working with your data. The data should not change in terms of what you start with and what you end up with if things are really re-executable. Okay, so now if we accept the notion that a reproducible experiment or publication is not a new idea and that reproducibility is a fundamental cornerstone of scientific work, then how do we modify traditional publication to include computational information that is essential for technical re-execution of today's neuroimaging research studies and to communicate findings such that others can generalize to and from our work? Or in other words, how do we get there in the highly computational realm of neuroimaging? Aha, so this is where the repo pub comes in. <clears throat> now, I borrowed this slide from Dr. Kennedy. Um, I think it's a really useful, salient set of reminders of, well, we want neuroimaging research to make a positive impact on people's lives. And we need the claims of the neuroimaging literature to be more generalizable as has been discussed throughout the course. So what we need, but do not currently have, is a way to report the computational spec specifications of our study components. So this is currently a problem, since the publications, in order to maintain readability, do not typically provide a complete specification of the analysis method or access to the exact data. So now this brings us to the RepaPub with the hybrid format of words, a text as usual, but with supplemental information to be included now that addresses these computational specifications, which we now have in all neuroimaging work. So the supplemental information on data, workflow specification, execution environment and results, so we're going to start with that. So now if we actually consider some of the basic elements of a neuroimaging experiment as an example, which by the way is really in terms of the elements of, a, of the experiment, really not very different from a classical experiment. There are subjects, there's data, analyses and workflows, resultant data from that, publications. However, what is different is that there is a computational component to every single one of these steps. So that means there's a lot of computational information and there's a lot of complexity to it. So we have, in a knowledge experiment, we have research elements, here, data, analyses and workflows, for example, and we have the provenances associated with them, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, but that's, that's the kind of the origin of all of these things. So that means we have a lot of computational information to deal with, and that is the extra component here. So if we now hit on provenance for a minute, and I'm gonna actually give an example that's not from science because I think provenance is another hot word like reproducibility right now. And it's very interesting, it's turning up in the lay press. Um, but I like this example, it refers to provenance and it refers to the French word provenir, which means to come from. Um, but the example they use is coming from the world of food and from harvestable produce. And what I particularly like about this example is that it refers to the complete natural environment, for example, of whatever harvestable crop might be under consideration. 
So that includes the soil, the topography and the climate. So that is actually a very interesting problem or, or set of factors, I guess I would say. It includes what the plant is growing in. Um, it includes climate. Well, the climate, you know, that actually seems like it's something that's important at the moment. Well, let's say it's a dry year. Well, that's important to know. It might affect the harvest that year, but it also might be that five years from now, it'll turn out that the year that had the drought turned out to also affect not only how the plant grew and what the yield was for the particular harvestable item, but it might also turn out that because it was so dry, well, the pests in that particular area were different. So that means that maybe then the pesticides were different to treat the pests. Well, someone has a you know, dietary response to the pesticide or something else. I mean, it, there are all kinds of permutations of that, but the reason I think it's interesting is that it's not only, it's not only a full context and how much goes into the fact that that one potato, let's say that you got from that particular year's crop has all of these things that might've happened along the way um, that manifest both in the produce itself and the consequences of consuming it potentially. So I think that that's a, got a forward and backward aspect to it. And there's a lot of information there. Now, I realize that's coming from, from the non-science world, but remember we're we're, we just were, were referring to this experimental flow up into imaging experiments. So where we have a lot of providence about what's happened to the data. Now, so if we now consider that we have the research element such as data or such as a workflow and we have the associated provenance for that research element we, and we have a digital link to connect the research element with now this computational information about the whole history of that element you know for example with your with your acquired scan well there may be there's information about the scanner and what operating system was used and that's just a very small example but it's to combine all these, these pieces of information is what we're really working on here. So research objects are an important tool. An example of a data research object might include a data set, the research element, plus some associated provenance such as a scanner, hard and software used to collect the data. A workflow research object example could include a specific workflow, the research element, plus some associated provenance such as a containerized workflow including execution environment plus version control script. Example of a statistical research object could include a specific statistical analysis, and that's the research element, plus associated provenance in the form of a version controlled script used to run a specific statistical analysis. Now, in each case, there is a digital link connecting the specified research element and its provenance. So that brings us back now here to the repro pub with the words as we discussed, but now we have research objects for each of these elements. So we've got a lot of extra supplemental computational information that we can, can include. Okay, so now, now we've got a construct so we can actually go about testing it. <clears throat> so the first thing is the print and folks and their collaborators took on the challenge of creating a fully re-executable experimental workflow that would stand the test of publication reproducibility. Okay, that sounds good, but what does it really mean? Or what does it require? And how can this problem be defined simply to serve as a proof of concept, which is what this is about. So take a simple experiment, run a simple data analysis, collect the provenance for each research element, and we'll link those to create research objects. So we have a specified data flow, a defined workflow, sorry, a specified data set, defined workflow, an execution environment. And remember that's something, you know, that includes, for example, the, the computer platform and the operating system that you might be working with, as well as um, software that may be included in your analyses. And the research generated by the execution of this workflow on a specified data set, that combination is what we were just looking at here. Okay, so we're looking at these components, but just those components. This is actually a straightforward experiment. And the objective here is then to verify the re-executability 
under each of the generalized generalization conditions on the reproducibility spectrum. Okay, so this is the first re-executable publication with this ReproPub hybrid. And it does indeed exist. This is, the, this is an F1000 paper. Um, and in each of these cases, the research object does have links available. So you, the reader, could actually go to this exact information. You can go to the data, the exact data. You can go to the exact workflow specification. You can go to the execution environment and you can see the results. You can actually access all of these things yourself. So what's the conclusion from this? Well, it worked. A simple analysis executed on a publicly accessible open data set in a controlled environment and with a precise workflow was publishable in the form of a repo pub. It's a hybrid of texts and research objects. And from all, it is re-executable directly from the supplemental materials in the repo pub, which allows readers to combine materials, methods, and provenance. Now, in addition, I've taken the, this is part of the conclusion from the paper itself, which says, this provides a roadmap to enhance the reproducibility of neuroimaging publications. And we expect these types of publication considerations to advance to a point where it can be relatively simple and routine to provide supplementary materials of this sort for neuroimaging publications. Great. So given that the proof of concept has actually worked, now we can actually do the next test, which is, well, let's test a biological hypothesis. So in this case, we'll do an experiment in the reproductive way. We'll do it in the same way that the simple one experiment was done. But in this case, we identify a hypothesis that has been reported in the literature. In this case, IQ is positively correlated with brain volume and typically de developing children, according to Pichin et al. We're gonna test that hypothesis in the generalization zone now, we're going to test the hypothesis using similar data, all relevant data from open source data sets from the by one and ADHD data sets, similar workflow, and a similar environment, and collect the results via this processing screen. So we're going to look at the generalizations and the reproducibility of those. Well, Okay, so here, for example, we do have a workflow specification. It's been pre-registered. We have the workflows and the data sets and the statistical analysis and results. All of these now actually are connected to their sources. So they are directly available as we just saw with the previous experiment. And in testing the hypothesis, we find that as the original authors found with our re-execution here, um, that the total brain volume and IQ are positively correlated. So the finding from an external group that has been previously published in the literature is one that we are able to test using similar but different data, a similar but different workflow, similar but different execution environment. And we get similar results in this case. So in this simple two test of the repo pub construct, we were able to test the generalization of a published finding using similar but different data and a similar but different analysis. Our retest experiment yielded a similar result as we also found a positive correlation between IQ and brain volume in typically developing children within 479 subjects. So to sum up, we have now tested the generalizability of a prior finding in the literature published by others by redoing the experiment in a similar way using the ReproPub method. A resulting ReproPub study will now be identically re-executable given the supplemental computational information collected and linked to our experimental steps. So we have research objects. The study will now also be living and expandable by us or by others with the use of different or additional data that can be exactly re-executed, analyzed or reanalyzed as the case may be the generalizability of results in an ongoing fashion. Now, envisioning the potential 
of the repo crib going into the future is actually a very interesting thing. So we've got some examples now of directions of things may go. And I will say, I think this is actually very, um, there's a lot of imagination in this work and a lot of um, tech savvy that goes into it as well too. But I think that there are a lot of implications even beyond the applications we're gonna see here that are just fun to think about. But what we do have, for example, is comparing, um, we've got a regression in a traditional publication well, we've got a scatter plot and a regression line and we can, we can get the numbers on that. However, in the Reprenim publication, the possibility exists now that we can actually go to a point on a figure and from that point link digitally to what workflow generated it, for example, and the provenance associated with that, with the software and hardware and all of those things behind it. So this whole workflow here, which I'm not gonna enumerate, but the, it's just the concept that I think is really important here is that it becomes possible to actually start thinking about having a dynamic publication from which you can find out all kinds of things. You can research directly off the, you know, the data and the representations and the findings and, and explore them further. Likewise, um, in a, in a consideration of statistical regression in a traditional publication, you get the report of that. In a reprint and publication, there is now going to be the possibility. This is future thinking, but it's you know just an example of what things may be possible now with things linking, and that is that you can go to this regression, and you can click on it, and what it can do is go from this regression line to the exact script that runs the statistical analysis. So if you actually do some work on this or someone else does some work and they want to contribute to the idea and they pull their data and then want to rerun the correct regression, that now becomes possible and it becomes possible to find all of that from a publication. So things are connected in a very large fabric that that is very engaging in terms of the ways that it can enable you know, scientific curiosity among other things, but actually then a lot of tests and retests and exploring of the data both forward and backward. And this is one of the reasons that I was mentioning in Providence that I think it's it's important that actually what you record as the as the origin of what you're doing can become important later. You reference it later because of the question that comes up later, but you can go back and find that information now. So, um, at this point now, we can kind of recap the problem, which is that we started off with a focus on reproducibility and the goal of more reproducible research. Why? Well, because reproducibility is a fundamental building block to the advancement of scientific discovery, enabling generalization across research findings and propelling evolution of knowledge as driven by confirmation or refutation of prior or future findings. And we concluded that this emphasis is not a new idea in fact, reproducibility and generalizability are and have long been intertwined in the process of scientific experimentation and publication. But neuroimagers and big data scientists in general are facing the dilemma of how to modify a traditional scientific publication to now include computational information that is essential for technical re-execution of today's neuroimaging research studies and to communicate findings such that others can better generalize to and from our work. So addressing the problem, the RepoPub. The RepoPub is a hybrid publication that includes both text and detailed computational specifications with the goals of providing sufficient information for reproducible work. We have now tested and verified this method for both re-executability, that's the simple one publication, same exact data, same exact analysis, different operators, same results, and for generalizability of a biological finding reported by others in the literature that's a simple to experiment. Hypothesis retested using similar data, similar workflow, similar execution environment to yield similar results. With this RepoPub construct, we've modeled a method that enables us to effectively update our experimental descriptions to enable precise re-execution of complex modern computational processes that are integral to neuroimaging and reproducibility. 
can enable test and retest experiments by us and by others to confirm or refute findings as more and more data becomes available, thus continually refining generalizations, which in turn supports scientific discovery and propels the evolution of knowledge. Thank you.